you know, kind of your support out there. I'm going to just remind everyone about um, a little bit about what's going on in terms of implementation, um, and then I'm going to answer questions, um, which I'm sure you must have a lot. So I like to think of implementation of reform in three phases. We have the early deliverables um, and the down payment on some of the important insurance market reforms. That's the early pieces in 2010, 2011, 2012. Uh, we have the build phase um, where we're trying to get the exchanges up and running and some of the delivery system reforms where we're trying to reward providers for providing better value health care and higher quality rather than just paying them for every more test they do, even if it doesn't improve health. That's been sort of the 2011 to 2014. And then, of course, in 2014 uh, is when we have full implementation. And, um, and I tell you, no one was more excited about um, the Supreme Court decision than the president because this meant that we got to go on with all of our work. All right. We've been working really hard. We have all these regulations we've been working on, and we were waiting and waiting and waiting. And we were, um, we know that states will eventually come um, come through for us, but we can talk about that. So in terms of the early deliverables, um, in terms of stabilizing the existing coverage, and you've all heard these statistics, but young adults um, under 26 on their parents' plan, with 6.6 .6 million kids are covered, 3.1 million of those young adults would have been uninsured. So some of them might have had other coverage but they're under the parents' policy. Chances are that's probably better coverage. People with pre-existing health conditions, the PSIP program, pre-existing insurance, um, pre-existing condition insurance plan, um, we have almost 70,000 people enrolled, um, and this is people who've been uninsured for six months and have a condition that um, makes the health plans reject them. Um, and we know, what we, we put out a report in February, the average expenditure for these people is $28,000. These are, we have very high rates of cancer, very high rates of transplant, people who have not been able to get health care and were very sick and putting off care, and we're just really glad that we've um, been able to provide them coverage. Um, seniors um, for Medicare beneficiaries, um, so far 5.3 million seniors have received uh, over $3.7 billion in savings on prescription drugs in the donut hole. Um, that donut hole is being phased out um, by 2020. It'll be gone completely. <laughs> million Medicare beneficiaries took advantage of either a free preventive benefit or a wellness benefit last year. Medicare didn't cover wellness benefits. You couldn't go see your doctor for an annual visit just to get a checkup because it wasn't covered under Medicare. Starting last year it was, and so now you can go see your doctor every year, not just because you're sick, but because you want to make sure you're staying well. And I think that's a really important part about changing our healthcare system from being a sickness system to one that's um, making people better and keeping them healthy. Um, down payment on market reforms, 105 million Americans are benefiting um, because they no longer have a lifetime limit on coverage. You know, a lot of health insurance companies, they said after a million dollars of not covering everything, now we know that 105 million people no longer have that lifetime limit um, and don't have to worry if they're really sick. And these are kids that, um, you know, in NICUs and really hit that cap and then have no place to go. So um, a lot of people have benefited from that. 54 million Americans with private insurance coverage, so non medicare folks, but folks under 65, have access to preventive services um, without cost sharing, um, and that's um, wellness visits and cancer screenings. Um, insurers can no longer rescind coverage. I don't know if you remember the stories before health reform passed. Somebody made a mistake on their application, and then when they went to go get benefits, the insurer would say, I'm sorry, you made a mistake on your application. We are going to rescind your coverage. We're not going to we're not going to repay your premiums, even though you've been paying your, your premiums. We're just going to kick you off the plan. They can't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> um, there's also appeal rights. If you want to appeal um, a health insurance decision, you can now do that. There's now a, appeal rights. You can actually go. There's an internal the plans must have an internal appeal process, and then if, if you don't agree with the decision that the plan is giving you, you have the right to go and get an external appeal. Um, this applies for plans that are what we call non-grandfather plans. Some plans are grandfather, but, um, but for the most part, um, um, most plans now have, the, um, have to abide by those appeal rights. Um, the plain language requirement that comes into effect is starting
like this all. Um, all insurance companies have to use the same definition for the same word. So if they're telling you deductible, co-insurance, it all has to mean the same thing no matter what you do. Have, it's an alliance created under the Affordable Care Act to prevent um, 
injuries in hospitals, so they're preventable injuries. We're going to reduce them by 40% for the next three years and prevent um, readmissions that were preventable. Um, in other words, somebody goes out of the hospital and then they go right back in. That actually happens really often in Medicare, um, you know, and that could have been avoided if somebody would have given you the right follow-up information, you know who to call if something goes wrong, somebody's checking on you, making sure you've got your medication. So we're trying to reduce those by 20% by the end of next year. If we achieve those goals, we will have saved 60,000 lives and cut Medicare costs alone by $10 billion. Um, we have 4,000 hospitals participating in that program, and it's voluntary. There is no financial incentive. They are volunteering to do that, um, which I think is really exciting. Um, I will tell you also, and this is an important point, when you hear you know, all these Republicans claiming you know, you're cutting $500 billion out of Medicare, um, you know, first of all, they, what they don't tell you is they've done the same thing. Um, all of them in the Republican budgets, um, they, don't, they don't get that money back. But this is, the first thing to remember about that is we're not cutting benefits. There are no cuts in benefits. We are not increasing your contract. These are um, making the system more efficient. One of the ways that we're doing that is um, cutting excess payments to managed care plans. So this is um, about $200 billion of that was um, because we're paying or before the Affordable Care Act passed, we were paying, we were paying HMOs 14% more than we would have been paying for, if the same beneficiaries had stayed in traditional Medicare. We're cutting all that out, and that's a lot of the <laughs> And we think, you know, we've heard cues and cries that we're going to lose all these private plans, but what we found is that so far costs have decreased and enrollment is still increasing. So this is really excess payments. So don't let anyone tell you that the, that, um, the Affordable Care Act hurt Medicare. But the other area where um, I think it's really important is um, that the Affordable Care Act included a lot of anti-fraud measures to try to catch um, people who are defrauding Medicare. And this is really important. There are a lot of, you know, 19,000 providers apply to be part of Medicare every month. We're doing a better job screening. Um, we're doing a better job trying to catch them before um, before they commit fraud, and we, are, we have to have the ability, instead of what we used to do is pay them and then try to get the money back. Mm -hmm. Now we, if we know they're committing fraud, we don't pay them. Um, and we have um, more money to go after folks. And so what we found is that we have saved $10.7 billion um, in the last two years in anti-fraud initiatives, through these initiatives from Medicare. We charged with healthcare fraud has increased by 75% since 2008. Last year we charged 1,430 people with Medicare fraud, um, which is a way to save the program without having to sacrifice beneficiaries. And I think that's really important. And that's really, I think, comes down to a really important point about saving the program and doing it in the right way that preserves the program and keeps it as a, you know, a benefit for all the seniors that are in it today and, and will be in it um, in the future. So um, again, I want to say we're really pleased about the Supreme Court ruling, um, and uh, we are looking forward to all of the good work, the next set of regulations we are working on. Um, starting in 2014, no insurance company can discriminate against somebody who has a pre-existing health condition. They can't deny them um, enrollment in their plan. They can't charge them more. They can't exclude coverage for those pre-existing conditions. So those are the rules that we're working on now. There's limits on what they can charge in terms of age rating. They only can vary premiums by um, age within certain limits, by geography, by family size, and then whether you smoke or not. And that's it. No more pre-existing condition charges. So we're working on those rules. We're trying to get those out. Um, but we're all really excited and fired up. And I want to say another time, thank you so much for all you do. You know, I worked on the field when we were working on the ACA, and just knowing that people like you were out there helping us and fighting for the fighting to get this passed really meant a lot. And, and you know, we actually um, members of Congress they keep track of all the calls they get. They look at the op ed. They we, every week we got a chart who was calling in for and against, and we got how, you know how many letters are coming in for, how many letters are coming in against, and it really matters. I mean, I, I really want to emphasize that. Your efforts, and it might not seem like much of the time, but I'm sure you've figured out, it really matters a lot. And it matters now. You know, we've got a job ahead of us, and that's making sure that everyone understands what the Affordable Care Act does. And so it's a challenge, and, and as Greg said, you know, opponents of health reform have spent $235 million um, of, you know, basically with misleading information. 
and people in, in favor of health reform have spent only $69 million. So we've got a huge task ahead of us, which makes your job just that much more important. But I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to answer any questions you have. Yeah.